Theo had spent the past two summers guiding canoe trips in the Lake of the Woods in Minnesota. And his claim is that he had a few run-ins and heard many stories from other guides about their strange experiences. Beings that had lived in this area for thousands of years and there were many places they couldn't camp on because they were Indian reservations. Now, Theo had heard this area specifically referred to as Wendigo country and there were actually multiple places named after it, like the Wendigo Isles, for example. Now, Theo also had plenty of stories that had been passed on by other guides, which were pretty terrifying. And the one he was willing to share was probably the most terrifying of all. It was him, another guide, and they had about seven kids with them on this one particular trip. Now, on the first night, they would stop after a long day of paddling at a campsite known specifically as Little Trisket. They had one camper with them that was somewhere on the autism spectrum, and due to this, he had significant communication issues. As they were making dinner over the fire that evening, this particular camper seemed to notice something in the woods behind the group, and he kept saying things along the lines of, who's that man in the woods? And he would describe this man as tall, very skinny, and very pale white, like a like an ashen ghostly white. Now, of course, Theo and the other guides just tried to assure him that there was no one there, it was impossible, and they even did a head count to reassure him and make sure that everybody was there. And of course, humoring him, they would check it out and they didn't see anything, they didn't notice anybody there, they just calmly brushed it off and went back to making dinner. But ladies and gentlemen, that same night, a different camper in her tent by herself, because she was the only girl on the trip, she also experienced something strange. As Theo and his co-guide were beginning to fall asleep, now at one point or another, they heard her start screaming and then stop. And because it stopped, they decided to brush it off and figured maybe she had night terrors, something was going on, but whatever could probably wait until morning. So the following morning, they had asked her what was up. And she had said that something was shaking her tent and she thought it was them. Well, it wasn't. And so one day, the boys were all in their tents and the girl was in her tent. And then when they took her tent down, they took the stakes out and two of them were apparently completely bent at a 90 degree angle. And so they're confused that this is even possible. And so they're messing around with it. They're testing the flexibility and they couldn't get these stakes to go back and budge at all. Now, Theo had been in some crazy wind storms out here, probably around 40 miles an hour, but he had never seen a stake bent like that. And so they left Little Trisket and all the weird stuff apparently stopped happening. Apparently they had an awesome trip afterward, but when they got back to base camp, Theo talked to another guy that had stayed at the same campsite the night after him. And Theo didn't say anything. He didn't encourage this conversation at all. She just outright told him that there was apparently some sort of large white creature at that particular campsite. And she would go on to tell Theo that as she was going to the bathroom way back in the woods and thought that another camper had accidentally come to her bathroom spot and ran away. And so confused by this, she goes back, but everybody was there fully accounted for. Nobody had even left the fire in the time that she had left. And of course, there were much scarier stories and experiences that other guides had also had who had been involved with this specific area. Now, Theo's claim is that there are easily hundreds of stories that are just like his and these other guides that go back hundreds of years from many, many natives in the area. Another eyewitness of the name of Bobby also shared his story. Now, ever since Bobby could remember when he was very little, he loved hunting squirrels and deer. And it began as an innocent bonding experience, something that him and his father would do together every fall. But after his father had perished, Bobby couldn't help but find himself out there more and more. I mean, it was his father's favorite thing to do. And so Bobby was just lucky enough to be a part of it with him. And going out there and doing it was a firm reminder that his dad was still with him. Maybe not in flesh, ladies and gentlemen, 
but spirit. Now, after the following experience, though, Bobby was scared to head back to the woods. So let me lay the groundwork for you guys. It was a snowy Saturday morning, and looking back, the sun had just come up. And that particular day, Bobby had been hunting squirrels, but the woods were deathly quiet and still. So Bobby was sitting there under the old dead oak tree, and he was just soaking up every bit of beauty he possibly could, enjoying the peace and quiet. Now, everything was suddenly stirred to life by what he described was a gruff grunting sound. Now, the noise was similar to a buck call at first, but it was so much lower and more visceral and guttural. Now, at first, Bobby thought a massive buck was dying out in the snow, but then it came again, but close enough to make his blood run cold. Whatever it was, it was not dying. It had moved at an impossible amount of distance within only a few seconds. Bobby honestly had no idea what it was he was hearing, and he did the only thing he could do. He sat still and tried his best not to breathe. Now, only a few moments later, he saw something that changed his life in the worst way possible. The head of what he described as a deer with a sickly look and eyes with way too much white appeared out from behind a tree, roughly no more than 15 yards in front of him. He described it as motionless, and worst of all, the darn thing was nine feet off the ground. Bobby had never seen any deer that tall. This thing looked like it had just been in a fight while fighting off a deadly virus. It was not a pretty sight to see. Now, a clawed hand appeared just below it, and Bobby instantly knew this was something from the demonic realm. It sounded like something out of a children's book of scary stories, and he wished that it could have all been untrue. But here he was, face to face with this thing. But here, ladies and gentlemen, were what he described as these dark, disgusting black nails sliding along the bark. And the way its head was angled, it was as if it was staring and boring its eyes into his very soul. Instinct eventually took over. Bobby grabs his gun and he runs as quickly as possible back to his truck. He had never ran so fast before in his life, but somehow he still heard this thing coming behind him and he could hear it grunting and moving and he could hear it inching closer, although he couldn't hear it running. It was as if it emitted no sound. Finally, Bobby reaches his truck, slams the door shut, starts it, floors the thing, but before he really took off, Bobby made one grave mistake. Now, with the way that Bobby described it, it was as if it had been copied and pasted that that thing's decaying head and clawed hand were now protruding from a pine tree at the forest edge. And Bobby learned something that day as much as he loves hunting because he grew up with it with his father and it reminds him of his father. He doesn't know if he'll ever be going back to that section of forest ever again. Yet another man by the name of Stephen claimed that he had encountered what he knew as a demonic Wendigo spirit deep in the wilderness. See, one summer, about six or seven years ago, Stephen had a couple of encounters with what he describes a Wendigo. His first encounter was on an earlier trip in the summer where their destination was into Shore Lake. And it was roughly a six day trip, which had about 60 miles of paddling on one portage, taking your packs and canoes over land to another lake. On day four, they were portaging back out of Sheol through a portage called Dead Man's Portage. Sounds made up from some horror movie story, right? But the portage from the Lake of the Woods into Sheol is called Dead Man's Portage. No idea why they call it that, but it's quite fitting. Now, there was a campsite that is pretty frequently used about half a mile from this particular portage, and they referred to this particular campsite as Dead Man's. Now, Stephen and his trip left Sheol Lake, aiming to get through Dead Man's portage and stay at the campsite right after it. It's a little long, but a nice highway of portage without too many ups and downs. And he believes the Canadian Park Service even cleans out this portage, which may be the only one that is frequently maintained in Lake of the Woods. 
Now the short paddle from the portage to the campsite is just surreal, beautiful. The whole entire way, it's through a little inlet with about roughly 10 to 15 foot high cliffs on both sides, covered in moss and gorgeous scenery, beautiful cedars. Stephen, in his trip, arrived at Dead Man's campsite, and later on, just before they were going to bed, they discovered they left their sleeping bag pack at the end of the portage. And at this point, it's right around nine or so, so it was getting pretty dark by this point, and Stephen and a fellow camper set off in a canoe with their headlamps to quickly retrieve the pack. Now, the paddle took them about half an hour at this point. You could really only see what your headlamp was shining on. And so they finally get there, they grab the pack, and they start to head back. Now, shortly after leaving, Stephen started to hear loud splashes of things falling in the water trailing behind them. And so he quickly dismisses it at first because beavers are pretty common in the area. And when they slap their tails, it sounds pretty identical to huge rocks being chucked into the water. But the splashes kept going and were right on his back as they kept paddling. And so Stephen looks behind him to see a huge rock the size of a basketball come flying at him and land in the water at his side. And so they begin to paddle like crazy, trying to get back to the campsite and away from whatever was chucking these giant, super heavy rocks at them. Stephen looked back between panels and on one of the cliffs, about 15 feet up, he sees two distinct red glowing eyes on it. The rocks stopped coming at them and they were able to make it back the rest of the way. The rest of their trip apparently went along nicely without any other encounters, but he never did feel too great about going through Dead Man's Portage and triple checked that he did not leave any packs there when he did. I was on a solo camping trip in the Mendocino National Forest. I had my dog with me and we were just enjoying the solitude and the beauty of the forest. I had set up camp near a small creek and was just relaxing by the fire when I decided to listen to some scary stories on YouTube. I know, not the best idea when you're alone in the woods, but I was in the mood for some chills. As I was listening, I started to feel uneasy. My dog, who was lying next to me, began to growl softly. I tried to brush it off as just my imagination playing tricks on me because of the stories, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. I decided to do a quick Google search about the Mendocino National Forest, and what I found sent chills down my spine. There were multiple reports of people going missing in the forest. What really catches my eyes is another family goes missing in Mendocino. I went through the different websites and news articles of people going missing but they were all a little hidden underneath national park websites and pictures of trees. I remember looking up the forest about a year ago and didn't see anything and realized that these stories didn't seem to be talked about much, which also piqued my intuition. It was stated that well over 100 people in the past eight years have gone missing and not been found, on top of many which are found dead. It just had my intuition super spiked I remember just how feeling unsafe I felt, how much I wanted to get out of there, and it just terrifies me. I feel so uneasy about what I was hearing, and to this day, it still bothers me. My dog and I are very close, and she was a stray that started following me one day, and I ended up bringing her home from Costa Rica. So her little growls along the way make me feel like there was something wrong, even though it was just a storytelling video. Those stories originate from somewhere. I have done a lot of solo traveling, both in and out of the country, and I have never had such a bad feeling. On top of seeing an unnecessary amount of dead animals in a national forest, which just seems strange. I don't think I'll be doing anything more like solo traveling again unless it's around civilization. Now, if you're at all familiar with the popular lore and legends of Native America, then you've probably heard of the infamous and mysterious creature often referred to as the Wendigo. Now, these bizarre and menacing beasts are renowned for their monstrous abilities 
and they've been major characters in tribal folklore for quite some time, specifically up north. Now, as settlers made their homes in these lands, tales sprung up of terrifying encounters with these particular monstrosities, often resulting in missing settlers blamed on these savage creatures. Even in this modern era, strange encounters with these things have continued to be reported time and time again. First, let's get a good idea of what a Wendigo actually is. Emerging from the myths of the Algonquin tribes lurking among the northern forest of Nova Scotia, east coast of Canada, and the Great Lakes region, the Wendigo is indeed a genuinely nightmare-inducing entity. Typically portrayed as an enormous beast with a height reaching of up to 15 feet and a terrifying blend of human and animal features, the Wendigo is synonymous with insatiable greed, ruthless murder, and cannibalism. Visual descriptions often present the Wendigo as an outrageously tall, skeletal figure with blazing eyes, lengthy yellow fangs, monstrous claws, and a long tongue, often accompanied by antlers. Or so the creepypasta variation shows this. However, there are countless eyewitness descriptions that have a completely different physical makeup. And as you'll see here in the more stories I'm sharing with you in this episode, you will see a variety in how people describe this thing. We recently moved into a new house out in the country. The house is more than twice the size of our house in the city. It's all updated and has no neighbors within a mile. It's a radical change from the life we lived in the city. But best of all, it was less than half of what we were paying for our old house. The house was a foreclosure, and when we asked the listing agent about it, she simply said the old family had abandoned the property. We really didn't think anything about it since those kinds of things happen all the time in apartment complexes when people don't have the ability to pay rent anymore. The first three months were pretty uneventful, with us settling into our new life, the kids getting used to the new school and new friends, and most of all us getting used to the big house and property. But then the weather turned cold, and things started to get weird. It started with noises from the back property, things we chalked up to being in the woods. Then the motion lights around the house started going off randomly, and once again we just chalked it up to being in the woods. But last night, that all changed. Last night was the most terrifying night of my life. One of the dogs was at the back door, whining and scratching. I assumed he needed to go to the bathroom, so I grabbed my flashlight and walked out the back door. Instantly, something felt off. The dog bolted for the back property, growling and snarling. It was a cold night, about 30 degrees but the dog plunged straight into the creek and out the other bank, running off into the woods in the back of the property. Flashlight bouncing, I ran after him calling his name. I got to the creek and made my way across the makeshift bridge, trying desperately to follow him. I could hear the dog still growling and barking from somewhere up ahead, and I pushed further away from the safety of the house and deeper into the woods, and that's when I heard it a shriek like I've never heard before in my life. It was a mix of a moaning wail and metal on metal. It echoed through the trees and froze me in my tracks. My dog bounded its way back to me and cowered behind me. I turned around and could just make out the warm glow of the house behind me. In the cold dark ahead of me, I swung my flashlight around, looking for the source of the noise. That's when I heard an even more terrifying noise. Out of the cold silence, my wife's voice floated all around me. Babe, the voice called out. I whipped back around, and I could just barely make out the image of my wife safely inside our house. The voice called out again. Babe, I'm right here, came the voice from deeper into the woods. Then came another voice just as clear as the other, and it was my dad's voice. Come out here, it called. I swung the flashlight around again, and this time caught the briefest glint of light bouncing off eyes. The creature was in the beam of light for barely a second, but it was tall, maybe six feet, and ashen white. It had long, spindly fingers that grasped the trunk of a pine tree, and then it was gone. 
I turned back and ran towards the house. I ran headlong into the icy creek and stumbled. My dog ran past me, making it back to the yard and up the porch. I dug my hands into the freezing, muddy bank and pulled myself out, not stopping to even look back. When I reached the porch, I scrambled inside. My wife frantically ran over to me, asking what happened. I just shook my head, uncertain myself what had happened. I had a growing sense of dread tonight as the sun began to fall. We kept the dogs inside, and I haven't dared to look out the back. But as I sit here typing, one by one, the motion lights in the backyard keep going off. Now, in a very chilling account shared by a Reddit user named Universe Master on Graham, who identifies as Native American, delves into a mysterious encounter that took place near an unnamed reservation during a camping trip when he was just 13. The trip started off as any other, but soon a series of disturbing events began to transpire, turning their adventure, ladies and gentlemen, into a nightmare. The campsite was littered with the lifeless bodies of birds, a very strange sight to behold, and you can't really ignore that. Items from their camp began disappearing without a trace, leaving them baffled and on edge. But things would continue to get worse, and they would hear footsteps around their campsite, and a foul, nauseating odor would occasionally permeate the air, adding already to the horrific atmosphere. The constant, unnerving sensation of being watched was ever-present, making it impossible to shake off the feeling that there was something horribly wrong. But despite all the occurrences, they decided to just stick it out, given they had been planning this trip for months and they were not about to give up that easily. However, on the day of their trip, something bizarre happened. More bizarre than what was already happening, the witness recounted a very strange thing. Now, although these occurrences were a disturbance, they did not deter them from staying for the final two days as they had been planning for months. However, one experience years ago on the day right before their departure, they had been strolling through the forest while looking for firewood when they heard rustling in the bushes. Now, as this happened, it seemed that all life ceased around them because they could only hear their heartbeat and the lone heavy footsteps approaching them. Then they heard their name called from what seemed every direction, yet echoed from in front of them while also coming from behind. The voice they recall was very harsh and raspy, almost like an animalistic imitation of their sister's voice, who had just recently left the trip due to stress only hours prior. Now this completely shut them down. They ran as fast as they possibly could back to their campsite while they heard the twigs and leaves crunching behind them. Once they had reached their campsite is when the footsteps suddenly stopped and they were relieved and slumped over to their cabin stairs when they slipped on a rock, slipping out of the makeshift fire, and then they described something almost supernatural in nature. As they're going back and they're relieved and they slump over to the cabin, one of them slips on a rock and nearly falls right into the makeshift fire. Now, almost right before they fall in, something stops them mid-fall, causing them to regain their balance. It was just as if somebody was hanging on to them and then pulled them back. And they're not sure what to make of it, but their family suggested that it was a guardian spirit saving them from an early death. But after that experience, they never went to the same campsite ever again and did not go camping for a few years after that. Still, what really scared them the most from back then was that when they had been leaving the campsite, they looked back from the car window and saw a figure standing at the tree line staring at them, and their descriptions of it were different than the stories I already told you. They described it as lanky and looking starved to the point of having its skin wrapping tightly against bones. But when they looked onto the pathway, the footprints were completely gone, and as they blinked, they rounded the corner and it seemingly vanished into thin air. This left them trying to comprehend what had just happened. Was it reality? Did they have some sort of mass hallucination? Either way, they were completely freaked out. 
And so their sister began asking them why they were so shaken. So they explained to her what they experienced and her face too went pale. And she had explained to them that before leaving, this horrific gaunt figure had been watching them across the riverbank and that it had noticed her and what she described was ran away on all fours at a fictional speed. She shakily said to them, I'm the sort of person who is skeptical of any claims regarding the existence of the supernatural. My wife claims to see ghosts and dead people and that she's an empath. I'll concede that she's a very good guesser regarding other people's emotions and the history of places and families, but I can't accept her statements as fact because they're not empirically provable. With that said, you can believe me or not, but what I'm about to say is something that even I have a lot of trouble disbelieving. I can't say I've had any paranormal experiences in my life, but there are several things that happened when I was quite young that I simply can't explain. By the time I was about 12 to 18 months old, I had either a memory or a very vivid imagination of my life before birth. I was floating up in the sky, standing on thin air. There was no land in any direction. In front of me was a kindly, middle-aged Native American man wearing a plain white robe. He asked me if I was ready. Some kind of vision flashed before my eyes, and I said yes. I somehow descended and experienced my own birth. Keep in mind that this is before I was able to comprehend what birth was, so I didn't even know about Native Americans yet. When I was about six or seven, I started getting very distinct mental images of something extremely disturbing. What I saw was a tanned, mummified-looking, emaciated dead face. The eyes were glassy but somehow horribly alive, and the lips and nose were shrunken. The creepiest thing about the face was the too wide smile and a full set of very white teeth. When I was nine or ten, I read for the first time about some expedition or other in the Antarctic where several ill-fated members of an expedition or a group died and were left behind. Their bodies were recovered in the 20th century in the article I was reading, and images of them. I had never seen a frozen body before. But as soon as I saw those pictures, I immediately correlated what I was reading with the thing I'd seen earlier in life. From that point onward, I started having almost real, waking visions, in a way that's hard to explain. More than just in my mind's eye, and yet not exactly as if it were actually in front of me, of something that is basically my worst nightmare. It was an eight to nine foot tall, and I know this because its head almost touched the ceiling, frozen corpse, completely naked with long arms and legs. It was the same face I'd seen before in my mind, with shrunken features. Only now, I had a full body that was just as emaciated and mummified as the head and neck were. I only saw it on cloudy days in late fall or winter, and always when it was between me and a window, so it was sort of backlit. It never made any motion to do anything. It just stared down at me with a horrible grin. In high school, I got on Wikipedia at some point and finally learned what the thing was. The Wendigo. For those who don't know, it's a mythical spirit creature. I was born in Connecticut and have about 1% Native American blood in me from about 400 plus years ago. My first traceable ancestors in America came over shortly after the Mayflower, and one of them married a Native American woman. Now, do you see the part why I'm so creeped out now? According to the legend, the Wendigo was an evil spirit associated with starvation, the winter, and cannibalism. It either lured desperate people into eating their fellow humans during the winter, or possessed those who did resort to cannibalism. There are various stories about how it looked, but most of them agree that it looks like a frozen corpse, generally taller than a human. And no, it doesn't have antlers like in all modern depictions you'll find via Google. It reportedly can ride on the wind, mimicking voices to lure the unwary into ambushes and has a heart made of ice. But here's the thing though, I experienced this 
before I ever identified what the creature was or knew about the legends. Only after almost a decade of intermittently seeing the Wendigo did I come across this description. This description is from Wikipedia and follows. The Wendigo was gaunt to the point of emaciation, its desiccated skin pulled tightly over its bones. With its bones pushing out against its skin, its complexion the ash gray of death, and its eyes pushed back deep into their sockets, the Wendigo looked like a gaunt skeleton recently disinterred from the grave. What lips it had were tattered and bloody. Unclean and suffering from separations of the flesh, the Wendigo gave off a strange and eerie odor of decay, decomposition, decay, and death. I've done further research, and all of this information I found from various sources all concur with what I saw. So, I'm remotely linked to the Native Americans with whom the legend originated. I have always had a deathly fear of dead bodies, especially mummified-looking ones, and I saw a creature from their stories long before I learned that what I saw matched the traditional descriptions perfectly. Our next chilling account comes from a Reddit user by the name of Cat. Now, this person doesn't reveal the exact location, but does confirm that it's a place where Wendigos have apparently been sighted before. Apparently, there's been multiple brutally mutilated animals all scattered around this person's secluded property. And they describe finding foxes and deer in horrifying states, their spinal columns ripped out and scattered about. The animals bore the marks of savage claws and teeth, their limbs torn from their bodies in a gruesome display. Now, in some instances, these poor creatures were gutted, their entrails grotesquely draped over bushes or trees, reminiscent of some twisted, nightmarish Christmas decorations. In other cases, the animals were simply ripped in two, with one half mysteriously missing. Now, this is already extremely disturbing, but as little did Cat know, the encounter with the unknown was about to escalate into something far, far worse. So, let's set the scene. The house is situated roughly 100 yards from a small stream that bisects a small wooded area. On the far side of the stream from the house, large trees stand tall. One day, while out there, a sudden chill and discomfort had washed over Cat and it felt as if they were being watched. And so they began getting extremely paranoid, having the constant feeling that someone or something was out there with you. Deciding it was best for them to head in, especially with dusk approaching and light waning, they began walking back towards the house, which by the way was uphill. And so at first the pace was steady, not too fast with a sense of purpose, but like walking off someone's yard after being told to leave. Then the feeling of being watched in danger intensified. Turning around, they spotted what they describe as a large creature about 80 yards away, roughly standing across the stream. This entity or creature or being took a step towards them and they weren't particularly athletic, but not weak either. A 20-yard uphill run through the woods would typically take them 30 to 40 seconds, but of course you throw in fear and adrenaline, and you can count that down to about 10 seconds. It was by far the most terrified they had ever been, the most adrenaline they had ever felt. Now you might wonder if dehydration or hallucinations could have played any part in all of this, but they had never had an hallucination before, and they were not dehydrated. Just 10 minutes prior to this encounter, they claimed that they had consumed an entire bottle of water, always ensuring hydration before exploring. And it couldn't have been a tree because every time they go out there, they would have to go where they would see it. And there wasn't a single tree small enough to even remotely resemble what they had seen. Now, since then, Cat has not seen this entity again, but believes that the Native Americans believe that this was a Wendigo as it is able to mimic human cries to try and lure people towards it. Cat even goes on to describe that oftentimes they will hear what sounds like a little girl calling for help in the woods or a baby crying. And every now and then, Cat will also hear the voice or the mimicked voice of deceased loved ones beckoning her to come out to the woods. 
They're not really sure what to make of it, but they firmly believe it is in fact a Wendigo. Coming from the Lone Star state of Texas, we have another chilling account from a witness who swears that this event unfolded in the heart of Texas Hill Country during the sweltering summer. Now, I don't know about you guys, but if anyone out there watching this knows how hot Texas gets in the summer, whew, there's something as hot, but then there's Texas hot. All right, so the witness at this point was spending some time at his parents' place, which was a home shared with a multitude of feline companions nestled alongside a tranquil creek. Now, on this particular evening, one of the cats, which was a loyal companion who they named Topaz, pretty name for a cat, who typically accompanied this individual around on strolls on the property. And at this point in time, this cat was right by his side. However, there was nothing ordinary about this evening. This witness recounts some very bizarre events that transpired next. You see, there was a creek on the property as well. And while usually there, the eyewitness was never ever having issues while down there, but this one time had proven to be strange. Now, Topaz the cat was unwilling to cross into her usual spot, and the witness noted it was eerily quiet. It was noticed a little later that Topaz was acting as if something was threatening her, and just acting strange. You know how cats can be. And so the eyewitness looks up and claims to see this strange creature with long arms and very tall, but there was no recollection of anything like talons or claws, antlers or any matted fur or anything, but did remember very dark, large eyes, oriented forward like a predator's would be. And the strangest thing about the entire situation was that this eyewitness was entirely overcome with fear and dread, almost to the point of vomiting. The observer quickly grabs the cat, runs back to the house, and avoided the creek for ages after that, though oddly they felt quite certain that whatever that thing was, for whatever reason, wasn't able to cross running water. And so about a month later, they felt like it was safe enough to go back, and so they did. Now, as far as they knew, there was no family history on either side for hallucinations or mental health, and even if there were, this would have been their only experience with one their entire life, and it's been almost a full decade since this happened. Mostly, they were wondering if anything of this particular demonic description had been ever encountered in Texas before. And lastly, ladies and gentlemen, this chilling encounter hails from the untamed wilderness of Georgia's northern mountain ranges. The individual sharing this is a supposed seasoned outdoorsman who frequently embarks on camping and hiking adventures with his brother, Ryan. Now, on this occasion, they had set their sights on a very familiar location nestled halfway along the Jacks River Trail in the Cahuta Wilderness. Now, their plan was to spend two nights in the heart of nature, away from the busyness of all day life. And they found a nice secluded spot, set up camp, and spent the day exploring around Jacks River. Now, as the sun began to set and they started their fire and began to cook dinner and settle in for the night, just with the camaraderie together under the stars, things began to change for the worse. They described hearing a very disturbing noise. And so both brothers, well-versed in the symphony of the forest, found this sound to be very out of place. It was as if multiple individuals were stealthily moving around their campsite, trying to remain undetected. But what happened after that catapulted their experience from mildly unsettling to downright horrifying. They both pull out flashlights and they're shining them in the direction that they can hear the sounds coming from. But what was even stranger is that whenever they would fix their lights on a spot they thought the sound was coming from, the location of the sound would suddenly change. And that is when the whistling started in. Now, at first it was thought to be the wind and maybe the thought crossed their minds that maybe the wind was just throwing leaves around and what they were hearing was really nothing more than the wilderness and that they were overly spooked. And so Ryan looks at his brother and asked if he was hearing that too. Now, of course, the brother didn't answer because he was too focused on each individual sound and trying to find out what it was and there were two consecutive notes with roughly a three to four second gap, and then two more consecutive notes over and over and over again. And so Ryan kept asking if he heard that, 
and his brother kept putting his finger to his lips, trying to keep him from talking. Now, at this point, their anxiety and fear is just continuing to climb and to rise, and their jaws are clenching, their fists are tight. They are terrified, and at this point, they are not ready for whatever it was that's out there. The whistling would continue for what felt like forever, but thinking it through, it was maybe five minutes or so at most, when Ryan, who's finally had enough, shouts out into the darkness, Hey! Quiet. Dead. Nothing. Everything stops. The whistling stops. They sit there in silence for a few short moments when the woods begin to erupt with noise. Something was running in a circle, very large, mind you, around their campsite. And the whistling comes back. Two consecutive notes, again with the same three to four second gap, and then two more consecutive notes comes back. How could someone whistle this loudly without cracking while also running? At this point, they were done. They stood up, shining their lights in all directions, trying to just catch a darn glimpse of whatever this was screwing with them. Nothing. It felt close enough to touch, but they couldn't see anything. And that's when the movement stopped but the whistling was still constant. It was so loud, inhumanly loud. Ryan's brother looked at him and told him, we gotta call the police now, this is getting bad. Now this right here is the worst part. The part that they do not like to talk about. I'm getting chills as I'm telling you this. While Ryan is on the phone with the dispatcher, telling them their location and what exactly is going on, his brother steps around the fire towards the tent and inside folks, his bag, he had a six inch fixed blade that he had always carried with him and assumed he would feel a bit more comfortable with it in his hand more than his flashlight. And as he goes to unzip his tent, trying to keep his eyes towards the woods, he hears some movement directly in front of him. So he quickly sweeps his light in front of him and for maybe two seconds, he saw it. Now he describes it as it because it wasn't a person. It was a thing, probably about five feet up in a tree. Everything about it he described was long. Its arms, its legs, its neck, its fingers, everything. And it was fast. And as soon as the light hit it, it launched backwards off of the tree. He then heard it land but it either jumped an impossible distance or landed in a thicket because he said he heard it, but he never saw it. He doesn't think he has ever yelled so loud. He runs back to where Ryan was and sat down. Ryan kept asking him what he saw, but he's just in so much shock he couldn't think to answer. He just kept thinking about what it was he saw. And so as he's trying to process this and Ryan's still on the phone and they're trying to calm each other down, maybe 10 minutes had passed and they see a couple of flashlight beams coming through the woods and these three guys come into view asking if everything is okay. Immediately they begin to feel better and they start to settle down. And so these guys are trying to find out what's going on. They're making sure that Ryan and his brother are okay. And so Ryan and his brother tell these guys that they heard a lot of movement. They're not sure what's going on. They describe the whistling, the strange noises. They don't know what is following them. Now, one of the guys had actually walked around and came back and said he didn't see anything at all. And Ryan told them that they called the police and roughly 30 minutes afterwards, a park ranger shows up. Now, Ryan and his brother tried explaining everything to him, but of course, he just chalked it up to either a curious animal or maybe some campers trying to mess with them. So we really only have two conclusions. Either he hallucinated or he made it up, right? It's fake. Or he really did come into contact with something of the paranormal realm. But I'll let you guys decide that one. And because you guys have made it this far into the video, I want you now to comment down below, I ain't going in the woods. So I know who made it to the end of the video. Now go ahead and smack that like and subscribe button if you guys enjoy this content. As always, I love you all. Keep an open mind and I'll catch you all in the very next episode.